Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to be talking about the sideshow. This has become a passion of mine. You know, in, in magic, as, as Eugene Berger says, in magic there are many rooms. And one of the rooms we're going to talk about today, it's the sideshow. The sideshow. I have some things for show and tell. I cannot wait to show you. Um, in fact, let me get to some of these now. This is Brill's Bible of Building Plans. And what it is, it's a, it's a catalog. You go through here, and he's offering building plans for various effects. This is a giant guillotine. Uh, this is the uh, burned alive illusion. Uh, this is a sideshow stunts, like fire eating. So he offers instruction and building plans for these various things. But he also offers some things like, like a root beer stand and, and a hot butter popcorn stand. Uh, this, this is a catalog that used to go out to people that put together carnivals, uh, touring carnivals. And, and they would go through the catalog and they would, they would order illusions and they would order um, concessions and various things and rides. There's rides in here, car carousels, and they would build these things, and they would they would actually take large canvases and, and paint their own advertisement, so that when you came into the midway, you saw these huge advertisements that were hand painted. These things are highly collectible these days. This is Brill's Bible of Building Plans. If you, if you know the value of magic catalogs, then you understand why this is important. This is your ticket to original material, folks. A lot of this material is not being done anymore. It could be done, and you could be doing it. Brill's Bible right there. Take a look at that. Then you have the wonders. The extraordinary performers who transformed the Victorian age by John Wolfe. I'm going to read an excerpt from this when we talk about freaks. Now, now, when I say the word freak, don't get upset. We live in a highly sensitive time period. People are politically correct. People are offended easily. And when I deal with the subject of the sideshow, particularly historically and how it was viewed historically, and I get into the subject of freaks, um, people freak out. You know, please don't freak out. This is a historical topic. It's also relevant today, and I'm going to get into why. But I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Then you have this book here, American Sideshow, an encyclopedia of history's most wondrous and curious strange performers. This is Johnny Eck right here. Johnny Eck, by the way, is a local. He's from Baltimore. I don't have the details on the actual event, but I can tell you that this man who was born with no legs uh, did a sawing in half illusion at one point where he played the upper torso and someone else played the lower torso and it scared the living crap out of out of the audience that watched it because he hobbled off the stage this way and his legs ran off another way and it was, it had, I didn't see it but it had to be hysterical good for Johnny Eck. And then you have this book right here, The Abbott Magic Collection, Volume 9, Carnival Magic. Oh man, is this ever wonderful. So that's chock full of Carnival Magic plans, descriptions, how-tos, and this. I want you guys to go out and buy this. I'm telling you, uh, the first part, the, the latter part of this book is basically plans, and ideas, workshop plans, and so on. That's good stuff. But the front of the book is, is testimonies and stories and histories. And the one that I love the most, and the one that is really the longest, is uh, written by, I believe, Walter Hudson, Sideshow Archive. Oh my, this is, it reads like a novel, man. And you know what? Walter Hudson had the good fortune of being a sideshow magician. And he just, this is his memoir. This is, these are his memories, his reflections, his thoughts, his experiences in the sideshow. And it is just absolutely wonderful. So I highly recommend that to you. Now, I will tell you that 
that since I began my study of the sideshow, I have added a to my main. I have I have several different shows that I do. I have a kids show. I have an elementary school show. I have a preschool show. I have an adult show. To my primary adult show, I have added a section that I call Sideshow Magic. And I introduce the subject of the sideshow, I give a little bit of a history on it, and then I do some sideshow bits. And one of the bits that I do is the blockhead illusion where I actually hammer a nail into my head. Uh, brilliant. I mean, um, Walter deals with this as well. Walter was doing a traditional magic act. He was doing the egg bag. He was doing the razor blade trick. He was doing the professor's nightmare. And the guy who was doing the blockhead left the show, but it was such a sensation that the guy who was running the tent decided to get Walter to do the blockhead. Uh, Walter always found it disgusting, but when he started doing it, he found that the audiences loved it and he fell in love with it. And that was my experience with the blockhead as well. The audiences just, they cringe, they scream, they have a great time. It's wonderful entertainment. So, by the way, uh, let, let, me, let me focus on this right away. Uh, I am attracted to the entertainment, to the sideshow effects, what might be called geek magic in, in another category. Uh, I'm attracted to that sort of thing. And I enjoy it and I enjoy performing it. I am less attracted to the physical deformity and the putting on display of of that sort of thing that which is all part and parcel with the sideshow but we'll deal with that in a moment sideshow sideshow means something different from the main show so people would come out now the heyday the golden age of the sideshow was really before television maybe even before radio you had uh, rural communities, you had people living in small towns, and you had shows that would come through these small towns, sometimes on horse-drawn carriage, sometimes they'd come in on the train, uh, but they'd come in, they'd set up tents in, in a rural area, people would come out from the town to see these shows, you'd walk down what was called the Midway, and you had you had what was known as barkers. Some people call them talkers. These are the guys. These are the guys that are wearing the the white and red striped jackets with the with the straw hats and the canes. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Step right up. See the seven wonders of the world. And then they would talk about. They'd have these huge posters. See the dragon lady. See the electric lady. See the man driving nails into his skull. Ten cents get your admissions. Ten shows for the price of one. Ten shows under one tent. Step right up. And you'd come into these shows and you'd see basically ten acts under one tent. That's why they call it the ten in one. Uh, sometimes uh, the ten in one is opposed to the sideshow, but these were the sideshows. You, you'd go to another tent and you might see... Uh, a Ripley's Believe It or Not style museum where you'd see uh, 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 two-headed Siamese twin or you'd see uh, you'd see the mermaid right uh, and a lot of these were hoaxes of course but but uh, this is the kind of thing that that uh, I, I'm certainly attracted to and, and, that, and that I'm finding that's really enhancing my show so the side shows something different it, 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 traditionally, as far as performance art, it included fire eating, sword swallowing, knife throwing, body piercing, laying on a bed of nails, walking up a ladder of sharp, sharp uh, swords. Uh, you know, you name it. Uh, they they did it. In the 1500s, uh, freak shows uh, originated pretty much in England. By the way, if you read this book. Uh, he documents, and, and this gentleman, um, this is Dr. John Wolfe, is a researcher, writer, and historian specializing in 19th century cultural history. He read history at the University of Cambridge and has a PhD on Victorian freak shows. A PhD in Victorian freak shows. 
He has worked in television, radio, and film, and was the co-writer for the best-selling Audible book, uh, Victorian Secrets, with Stephen Fry. So, uh, a, a very talented person. But he documents how the royals used to, used to buy freaks for their own personal entertainment. And they would keep them, keep them as part of the, of the royal, um, uh, the royal employment contingent there at their castles and palaces. And, uh, and this is where the freak show originated. You know, P.T. Barnum took, took General Tom Thumb over to see Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria absolutely fell in love with the guy. So, uh, so really, the, the, the origin of the freak show, or the sideshow, started with the royals in England. Uh, but it was, it was P.T. Barnum. 19, it was 1835, 1835, P.T. Barnum started promoting the human novelties that he termed as freaks. It's really, the, the term freak, uh, applying to a performance artist with some sort of, some sort of novelty, uh, that term originated with P.T. Barnum. Uh, at least I think it did, and, and he thinks so too. A lot of people agree with that. Uh, because it's around 1835, 1840 that, that you get this. 1841, P.T. Barnum opens his larger freak show at the American Museum in Manhattan. Now, here's what happens. 1841, 1868, people come from all over the world to go to see P.T. Barnum's American Museum in Manhattan. In 1868, fire destroys the American Museum. 1868, fire destroys the American Museum. P.T. Barnum, at this point, he's got, and this is, this is what this gentleman makes the argument, that, that the freak show was giving people with certain disabilities employment opportunities that they weren't finding in the mainstream. You know, we have social services these days. They didn't back then. Now I'm not justifying it. I'm not just. I'm just saying that that there were some very wealthy people with some very serious disabilities because of the P.T. Barnum show. Now, 1868 fire destroyed. The P.T. Barnum has all these people that are depending on him for employment. So he starts to travel. He starts to travel. He he has a, basically a tent show. So now he's traveling around the country with this tent show, 1881, so now you go from 1868 to 1881, the circus came under the joint management and ownership of P.T. Barnum, James Bailey, and James Hutchinson. 1887, Barnum and Bailey's greatest show on earth was formed, and there you have it, folks. Now, a lot of people just like religious people are concerned about mixing and blending religions, there are some purists that want to make a distinction between the circus crowd and the carnival crowd. And I agree, there's a difference between a circus and a carnival. Um, it's really the carnival, when you begin to split, which is right here in 1881, 1887, the circus takes on a life of its own, the carnival goes a separate way, uh, I tend to want to go with the carnival, Father the carnival. 18, uh, 1907, so now we're after the turn of the century, 1907, Ringling Brothers is formed in 1907. Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus is formed in 1919. Now, so listen, I've got some things that I want to show you here. This is an advertisement for the Pit of Curiosities. You have the Fiji Mermaid, which was later proven to be a hoax. This was basically a, a skeleton of a, a, a chimpanzee, small infant chimpanzee, that was uh, attached to the skeleton of a fish, the Fiji Mermaid. Then you have the Tattooed Lady. At uh, one time in history, it was very unusual for women to have tattoos. Today, it's not so unusual. The conjoined twins, the oracle, 
the living dead doll, uh, a, a typical, a typical list of curiosities from the period. And here is a here is a photograph of P.T. Barnum and Charles Sherwood Stratton. Charles Sherwood Stratton became known as General Tom Thumb. He was born January 4th, 1838, passed away July 15th, 1883. He achieved great fame and fortune working alongside of P.T. Barnum. As I mentioned earlier, P.T. Barnum took him to see Queen Victoria. And Queen Victoria and, and General, uh, General Tom Thumb got along quite nicely. Here you have, uh, getting into the, the realm of freaks, this movie is a must-see film for every performance artist. It's called The Man Who Laughs, Victor Hugo, starring Conrad Veet. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we have some very disturbing history in, in our art. <clears throat> this film documents uh, some of the sideshow proprietors if they couldn't find a sensational freak to draw in the crowds, the marks as they call them, they would make one. And so this film documents one of these episodes where this person in a, at a very young age had his face carved so that a smile was constantly on his face. Uh, he falls in love with someone in the film. Uh, <clears throat> The love is unrequited, and there's a, a very touching scene where he's smiling and yet crying because he's not getting uh, the, the affection that he longs for. Uh, <clears throat> the Man Who Laughs, a very tender, sensitive portrayal of the darker side of, of the carnival. And then you have, <clears throat> then you have Freaks. Interesting story behind Freaks. So, by the way... Uh, study Impressionist cinema, particularly in the early days, in the early uh, 19th, 1900s, uh, what you had, you had, you had people coming back from World War I. And the atrocities that occurred in World War I are just, just gut-wrenching. You had people coming back with severe disabilities. Many of these people coming back from the war found employment in the sideshow. Because of their severe disabilities, they were an attraction. Very similar to the way the Elephant Man was an attraction in his day. This film documents, in fact, Johnny Eck, Johnny Eck, uh, a local Baltimore entertainer, uh, was one of the featured uh, freaks in the film. Many of the freaks in the film were actually World War I veterans that had severe disabilities as a result of war. And uh, the film documents a young lady who, uh, one of the freaks falls in love with her, but she looks down her nose at him. And uh, she herself later becomes a freak. And, and, uh, and of course, the, the, the lesson here is, you know, only look down on someone with the intention of lifting them up. Uh, so, so it's an excellent film. It was made by Todd Browning, who is the director of Dracula. Now Universal Studios hired Todd Browning to do Dracula. He had such a success with Dracula that they gave him carte blanche to do whatever he wanted, and he chose to do Freaks. And it really, to, to not not uh, not cause a pun here, it really freaked out Universal Studios when he unveiled this film. Uh, but it is an important film, and it. It really should be watched. Now, let me give you the definition of freak from this book here. Um, let's see, it's on page 13. Yes, here it is. The Wonders by John Wolfe. According to Oxford English Dictionary, the freak, short for a freak of nature, means an abnormally developed individual of any species, in recent use a living curiosity exhibited in a show. A living curiosity exhibited in a show. 
also referred to as monstrosities, oddities, novelties, marvels, and wonders. It was only from the 1840s that the term freak was used consistently in the world of entertainment. There were born freaks, such as dwarfs, giants, uh, and exotic freaks, such as cannibals and savages, and self-made freaks like the tattooed lady, or those performing novelty acts such as sword swallowing, fire eating, and snake charming. So in some respects, the magician is thrown in here. Because if you have three categories of freaks, born freaks, exotic freaks, and self-made freaks, the sideshow encompasses the magician. Freak is not a quality that belongs to a, the person on display. It is something we create. A perspective, a set of practices, a social construction. The freak, in short, was a creation and a presentation. It's hyperbole. It's show business. It designated a persona, an identity, which existed only on stage. General Tom Thumb was a freak, but Charles Stratton was a freak performer. The freak show as a formally organized exhibition of people with alleged and real physical, mental, or behavioral anomalies for amusement or profit really evolved at the hand of P.T. Barnum. Now, there is something else I want to share with you that I think is really important from page 79 of this work, Abbott's Magic and the American Sideshow. Um, page 79, where this is Walter Hudson, who was a magician in the sideshow, the 10 in 1. He traveled with one tent, not the whole carnival, one tent, 10 acts under one roof. And he makes this distinction. There are three kinds of freaks in the business. The first are the real freaks. The people who are born different. The second kind of freaks is self-made. Most of the half-men, half-women are self-made freaks. Uh, the third kind of freak are out-and-out -out fakes and the worst. What about magic act? What about the magic act? How does that fit in? You are called working act. Any novelty act. We need your type of act to fill the show. Now, Walter Hudson is asking, now he's a teenager at this point, and he's asking the carnival owner, where do, where do I fit in? I, I'm not a born freak. I'm not a self-made freak. Where do I fit in? You are called a working act uh, and other novelty acts as well. We need your type of act to fill out the show, but the real freak is what brings in the marks. In other words, in this day and age, it's the Johnny Eck that was attracting people into the tent. They'd come in to see ten shows. One of them would be Johnny, and another would be the magician. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this. This is uh, the Abbott Magic Collection, Volume 9, Carnival Magic. Uh, a lot of this stuff I'm talking about is documented in there as well. I know this is a difficult subject. Um, and again, it's not, my, it's not my purpose to focus on the physical abnormalities. My purpose is to look at where magicians were in this environment and maybe resurrect some of what magicians were doing. Uh, because I think that... If you're a busker, you already know this. That there, there is a, a way that you get people to sta stop. Their, people are passing you by, and you need to get them to stop and look. And then there is the carnival magician. You've got people walking down the midway. They've got choices all around them. What's going to pull them into your tent? What's going to bring them back into your tent? That's a relevant question today, because our job is to entertain so, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at the sideshow. Thank you so much for joining me. Please comment down below. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Thank you so much. I will talk to you next time.